Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth CSF podcast with a focus on psoriatic arthritis. We'll be bringing you new episodes on a bi-monthly basis alongside our AXPAR podcast, and we'll also be supplying you with monthly slide decks to keep you up to date with the latest research and publications in the field of PSA. My name is Peter Nash, I'm Professor of School of Medicine, Griffith University in beautiful downtown Brisbane, and joining me today is Professor Laura Coates, then IHR Clinical Scientist and Senior Clinical Research Fellow at the Oxford PSA Centre. So hi, Laura. Welcome, and I'll okay. hand over to you to discuss one of the papers that we're going to talk about today. Sure, thank you, Peter. Um, so there's a couple of papers we're discussing today, and the first of two publications that we're reviewing relates to the safety and efficacy of bimikizumab in patients who are biologic naive with psoriatic arthritis through to 52 weeks. And then the second paper we're going to discuss is looking at the real-world safety and efficacy of upadacitinib in patients with PSA who've had an inadequate response either to conventional DMARDs or biologic DMARDs. So our first paper is that focused on bimikizumab, um, looking at treatment in biologic naive patients with active PSA, and it's looking at the 52-week efficacy and safety results from the B-optimal study. So this is from the phase three trials of bimikizumab, um, an IL-17A and F inhibitor, and this paper is authored by Christopher Richlin and colleagues, including me. Um, so this is obviously a relatively new medication. We've just had approvals for this in the UK. And it's different from the existing IL-17 inhibitors because it blocks both IL-17A and IL-17F, whereas the um, IL-17 inhibitors that we've had before have just been IL-17A inhibitors. And we've seen in these phase three studies that bimikizumab is more effective than placebo after 16 weeks in these patients who are biologic naive, and also in a second study in those who've had a previous inadequate response or intolerance to TNF inhibitors. But this study was really looking at the longer term safety and efficacy out to 52 weeks. So they looked at responses, as you'd expect with all the typical clinical outcome measures, ACR outcomes, ACR 20, 50, 70, PASI responses and minimal disease activity. And you can see very clearly that those responses are sustained from week 16 around the primary endpoint out to week 52 in those patients who continue on bimikizumab. And those patients who originally had placebo in the first 16 weeks show a very similar improvement in efficacy to those who originally had the drug by week 52. So they've kind of caught up uh, and got a good clinical response as well. Now, obviously, a lot of patients in these clinical trials will experience a treatment emergent adverse event, um, and nearly 80% of the patients had one adverse event in the trial, um, but quite a low number, around 7% were serious treatment emergent adverse events. And perhaps as we'd expect, given that this is an IL-17 inhibitor, um, a lot of those issues were around candida infections. Most of those were localised and non-serious, but obviously they can be annoying for the patients. Um, but we know that this very much goes with this particular mode of action. So what we're seeing in this paper is that we've got consistent efficacy out to week 52 in the treatment of these PSA patients who are biologic naive, showing that we can show this ongoing efficacy with the drug. We see similar improvements for those who were on placebo and switch they're catching up uh, out to week 52. And we're seeing pretty good tolerability, I think, with bimikizumab. The safety profile is quite consistent with the other trials of bimikizumab, also quite consistent with other trials of other IL-17 inhibitors. And there's no new major concerns that were identified uh, as part of this study. So I mentioned, you know, we have this drug, um, it's just been through nice uh, approval, or it's in, I think, just, just waiting for a final decision. Um, it's been approved for use potentially. Um, have you had much experience with it, Peter, down under? Same with, same with you, Laura. We've only had it in clinical trials. I think it's about to be approved for PSO in our country, and we're waiting for the PSA approval. I think it's nice to see that there's no loss of effect over time. Tachyphylaxis, it was one of those original 
I think the 1223 inhibitor and infliximab lost effect over time. And uh, that was one of the things that was important to show that it was persistently effective. Are you convinced that blocking F gives you any advantage over blocking A it's by itself? That's one of the questions that always comes up with this drug. Yeah, I think I think that's still a tricky question. So we haven't got a head-to-head -head comparison. Um, these patients are always a little bit different. I think there is probably more of an advantage in the skin. Um, and we've had this drug available in dermatology for a bit longer in the UK. So it has been increasingly used in dermatology. Um, and we knew from the um, kind of basic science studies that were done in the run-up to these big trials um, that there did seem to be a higher proportion of IL-17F seen in the skin. And so that would kind of fit with that increased um, efficacy. Whether that's giving us a significant benefit in the joint disease, I think is less clear. Um, but it did seem in the phase three trials that the results, particularly in those who were biologic experienced, seemed to be better than maybe we would expect. Um, a very good difference between drug and placebo even in those trickier patients to treat. Um, and that's obviously a big issue for us in clinic. We have a, an increasing number of patients who have already experienced a biologic uh, and have lost response or, or had other issues and had to switch. And I agree it's an important group because you know many countries with biosimilars, so we're being forced to use the TNF first, whether we like it or not. So it's nice to show that there's a there's a you know superior efficacy in that group and that'll feed over to the others. I wonder if the concomitant methotrexate is an advantage, disadvantage, necessary, not necessary. I've yet to see uh, all those numbers and things. Any comments, Laura? So I think from the data in the trials, there was no significant difference. We tend to, in these trials, see about half the patients on methotrexate and half not. Uh, and pretty much all of the trials that we've ever looked at have never shown a big difference. Uh, in those who were on concomitant methotrexate or those who weren't. Um, obviously, the, the potential benefit that was raised was around longevity in real-world data sets, um, in big registries. But all of that data has really been with TNF inhibitors, and we haven't really had good data looking at the non-TNF biologics and whether they really need methotrexate. Um, because we have limited options, I often leave my patients on methotrexate just in case if they're tolerating it okay, but certainly those patients who, who hate methotrexate, and there's a fair number of them, um, we I would happily stop it and leave them on monotherapy um, without too much worry. It's a practical issue because a lot of these patients are overweight, fatty liver, abnormal liver tests, they drink too much alcohol like all Australians, and so it's nice to have the option to, to come off. We tend to start in combination because in our in our place, at week 12, they have to have reached like an ACR 50 to be eligible to get the next six months. So we tend to use combo for 12 weeks, get them over the line, and then wean the MTX if the patients haven't already done it, and maybe add it back in later if there's a flare or a skin or joint change. So I just wonder how many 17 inhibitors we need. I was looking uh, on the web, and there's seven in the pipeline, including is Bep and a whole series of other ones. It's nice to have a couple, of course, yeah. um, but but it's going to be hard when there's four, five, six, seven, and then the biosimilars. And I just wonder how many should be developed unless there's some huge advantage one over the other. Yeah, I mean, I think it's whether there are significant differences that make them different. And obviously with TNF inhibitors, we've seen particular drugs coming out with with their own, you know, major benefits you know we've seen the data with with sertilizumab and pregnancy which is very reassuring we we saw adalumab take a big market share away from um older drugs because of its efficacy in ibd and other things so i think there has been a push in these um il-17 inhibitors that are still in development to think about different ways of doing it so you've got things like nanobodies um and there are nice scientific explanations for why that might be beneficial. Maybe an albumin binding site helps it penetrate the tissue better. Maybe being a nanobody and something very small helps it get into avascular tissues like emphases better. 
Um, but the proof always has to be really in the clinical data. Um, just like I think we haven't seen a strong signal that blocking IL-17A and F is better for joints than blocking IL-17A. Um, what we need to know with these other different molecules that are trying to block IL-17, whether that does actually lead to a definite clinical benefit or whether it's more the detail that maybe doesn't really matter, that actually what we're doing is just blocking IL-17A. And I think the important thing about the 17s is their safety, apart from this little bit of cancer that doesn't seem to be much of an issue. And even the uh, IBD stuff, one in a thousand at, at worst, we've seen no opportunist infection. We're seeing no TB reactivation. We're not seeing the cellulitis and the chest infections and the bladder infections that we just know and love and use TNFs every day and just put up with on behalf of our patients. So I think it opens the door for combinations and it opens the door for a, for a more aggressive approach given that their safety record. And I must say in many places where they aren't forced to use a TNF first, we're going to this drug first and the TNF down the line mm -hmm. um, because of that safety, but everyone's different. So it'll be different country to country, I imagine. Um, yeah, we'll comment on that. We've seen very similar clinical outcomes, haven't we, in nearly all of the trials. We see very similar ACR 20, 50, 70s. Um, it's very difficult to really pull apart the different drugs. So it's often that the non-joint outcomes, so skin and axial efficacy, and then the safety that really helps us make the right decision for that individual patient, doesn't it? Yeah, so I think it's a big advantage for this group and for the 23 inhibitors as well. So shall we move on to our second paper, which is entitled Treatment with Upadacitinib in Active PSA, Efficacy and Safety Data from the First 192 Patients from the UpJoint Study, which is a multi-centre observational study in clinical practice, authored by Stephanie Werner and her colleagues. So we've seen the efficacy of UPA in a number of clinical trials. And they are clever enough to have an active comparator in their trials, particularly the MTXIR study, which gives us a bit of a feel for comparison without having to have a head-to-head -head and all the patient numbers that that's required. So the efficacy has been demonstrated in RCTs, both uh, MTX naive and inadequate response to biologic DMARDs. But we like to see real-world data because the patients in real-world studies can never get into clinical trials because they've had a malignancy a few years ago or they've had other infective issues, bronchiectasis, et cetera, et cetera. So the safety and efficacy in routine clinical practice has been lacking. So it's nice to see this data coming out from various observational cohorts and the more like the patients that we have to treat every day. And with the oral surveillance issue about safety, where the FDA decided with one drug in one disease to slap a black box on the whole class in every indication, a very non-evidence-based decision. Let's see what this study showed. So 192 patients completed the week 24 visits and were included. The proportion of patients achieving MDA increased a little over time to about 40% of week 24 which is in the ballpark of the other biologics that we're used to seeing around the 35 to 45% with the TNFs and the other agents. The number of patients in DAPSA remission increased over time by 17%. The proportion of patients achieving resolution of important domains like dactylitis and anthocytis also increased while the patients who had uh, bad nails and bad skin improved nicely. And there were no new safety risks identified. So they said the proportion of patients achieving MDA, which is a target worthwhile achieving in this study, was in line with the previous RCT findings. The data supports the use as an effective treatment in PSA, whether it's inadequate response to a conventional synthetic DMARD or a biologic DMARD, and the safety profile remained consistent with that seen in other trials and no new concerns like MACE and VTE and the other push button issues were identified in this particular study. So how are you finding upadacitinib in PSA, Laura? Yeah, so I think, you know, we've obviously 
had similar issues in the UK in terms of the black box warning. The MHRA has very much followed um, EMA and FDA. So it's something that we are discussing openly with our patients and kind of including in our shared decision making. But I think it's been really useful for us, um, particularly in patients where we haven't had a great number of options. And I think that the majority of the patients that I put on to upadacitinib first were patients who had axial disease, for whom obviously we have limited treatment options anyway, and who also then had uh, IBD. So we were avoiding IL-17. Um, so really in that group, you've only got two mode of actions available. Um, and generally speaking, they've often had TNF inhibitors from gastroenterology before they get to us. So they're, they're a particularly tricky group to, um, to cover. But I think, you know, it, it is, I think it's sensible to be cautious and to be open with our patients about the safety risk. But it does seem to be particularly in a subgroup. Um, and generally speaking, I think, you know, this has been obviously a very effective drug. Uh, and as you said, we've seen nice head to head data against adalimumab showing how effective that is in terms of the joints and the skin. It's interesting that uh, now the gastros are starting to use UPA in inflammatory bowel disease. The derms are starting to use it in atopic dermatitis. Mm. So they're turning us, turning to us for some advice on how to use them the best in monitoring and screening and whatever. But it is interesting how the world turns. One of the things I found fascinating, and we don't see it, or at least I didn't see it much in rheumatology, is this little acne signal that mm -hmm. they're seeing in the atopic dermatitis patients. And I noticed that ducrevacitinib was getting a small acne signal as well. So have you seen any acne with the UPA? I've not seen it in any of our rheumatology patients. Maybe it's they're older happened. and it never happens. It certainly hasn't been a big issue. I think I have had one lady who did complain. Um, not that it would stop her taking the medication, um, also because she didn't have a great number of options um, and was very keen to be on something to control her disease, but but definitely raised it as an issue. So I think it does happen occasionally, but we haven't had a, a big issue with it where it's really affected whether people can stay on drugs. Yes. It's interesting how well they seem to see it. We never see it. And it must be an age difference and background steroids and God knows what else. So any other comments about UPA in PSA? I think it's still finding its feet a little. And I mm -hmm. think over time, it'll get used in all those different groups where it has efficacy and convenience of an oral medication. They're a younger patient population with less cardiovascular risk, et cetera. So I do think it'll get slowly but surely used over time. Yeah, I think I think the timing was a bit unfortunate in terms of launching the drug. So we'd had tofacitinib, um, but certainly in the UK, we couldn't use it without methotrexate, which limited our use um, and I think had not hugely taken off. But obviously the data with upadacitinib was very positive from the phase three trials, um, even in skin, where I think we'd been... Um, maybe expecting a, a less impressive result, but actually it did quite well in the phase C trials against adalumumab. It's not an IL-17 or an IL-23 kind of level of efficacy, but for most of our patients, we don't need that. Most of our patients have quite mild to moderate skin, um, and, and it did very, very well against adalumumab in the phase three trials, so that was really reassuring, but obviously it very much combined with this safety issue um, with tofacitinib in RA patients and and I think we still have a big question out there as to how well that translates to our PSA and our AXPAR population and whether the risk is really the same um, and how much we worry about the lower risk patients you know whether we can really select out the high risk patients and then use it more freely um, or whether it's something that we need to be more worried about. But given those warnings, it is something that we have to have a, an open discussion with patients about. And from the patient point of view, it's a scary prospect, um, isn't it? Even if your risk is low, um, it's, it's going to, I think, drive some treatment decisions from the patient point of view as well. So I think it, yeah, it's I think... more likely to be, you know, a second or third line agent um, rather than a first line option. Um, but like you say, it, it certainly has its use. It has good data. And particularly for those with axial disease, you know, JAK inhibitors are the only oral option that will give any, any idea of efficacy. 
um, in axial disease. So a really important option to have on the table for our patients. I, I agree. It covers all the domains. It's got x-ray evidence. It's got axial. It covers bowel. UVI just remains a TNF domain, but other than that, skin, nails, uh, across the board looks nice. So I just think over time it'll find its place and we'll end up using it more and more. And and uh, especially when they clarify some of these safety issues and yeah. identify the people at risk, maybe explain the mechanism of action so mm -hmm. we've got a better idea, is this a Jack 2 issue or is it a class issue, et cetera. Yeah. So thank you for joining us for this PSA podcast brought to you by CSF. We hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to our channels on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts from so that you don't miss any future episodes. If you want to read more about what we've discussed today, head over to cytokinesignaling.com where you'll find detailed summary slides of each of the papers. You can read the papers for yourself. And we'll catch up with you next time and we'd love to get some feedback. So thank you very much for your time today, Laura. Thank you.